Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we test your brain for weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Peter Bowditch looks back on confirmation bias. But first, here's news of faster tests. COVID breathalysers? With the Australian government finally allowing use of the 30-minute COVID-19 flow tests that were invented here by the Atomo company, 12 months after the rest of the world's already been using them, the technology may be eclipsed by much faster tests that don't need a swab stuck deeply into your throat and nose. The new rapid COVID test being commercialised by the Alkalizer company, based in Balcatta, Western Australia, can return results in just 10 minutes without using nasal swabs. The researchers came from the University of Technology, Sydney. An alkalizer test can detect SARS-CoV-2 viral fragments as small as a trillionth of a gram in a saliva sample. It detects both spike protein fragments using erbium-doped nanoparticles and nuclear protein fragments using thulium-doped nanoparticles. You spit into a saliva collector, then an oral test strip panel, called an eye strip, is lowered into the collector. This panel is placed in a tube with a collection of chemicals that deactivates the virus and releases the proteins. The resulting solution is placed in a cartridge going into a device that detects fluorescence from the nanoparticles in the strip, reacting to the presence of the coronavirus proteins. 10 minutes is considerably faster than the 30-minute flow test and the 24-hour PCR test we're currently using, but will it be fast enough to get the world moving safely? Two startup companies from Singapore each have different but similar COVID-19 tests that give results in just 60 seconds, also without the need for swabs. The small breathalyzer developed by Silver Factory Technology detects an infection by analysing volatile organic compounds in exhaled air. You blow into the tester for 10 seconds. Silver Factory was founded by researchers from Singapore's Nanyang Technological University. They're preparing to build their first facility for mass production of the breathalyzer. Silver Factory Technology's device can detect a positive case 95% of the time. Breathonics, a spin-off from the National University of Singapore, began the trial of its COVID-19 breath test at the Tuas Bridge checkpoint in late May 2021. It's being used to test hundreds of incoming truck drivers a day. The system also tests volatile organic compounds from the air exhaled into a one-way disposable mouth shield. The assessments can produce results in 60 seconds. Breathonic system carries an 85.3% accuracy rate. The technology was originally developed to detect cancer in the breath. The tests from both startups look for volatile organic compounds that have molecular profiles unique to people infected with the coronavirus. For identifying negative cases, Silvery Silver Factory Technology holds a 97.8% accuracy rate and Breathonics 97%. Anyone who tested positive in either test will undergo a PCR screening for confirmation. The accuracy of both products has been certified by Singapore's Health Sciences Authority. To prevent the spread of coronavirus variants, the Singaporean government requires workplaces to conduct regular testing and event venues to screen guests. Fast breath testing could allow these tests to become daily tasks. Both Silver Factory Technology and Breathonics have applied for licenses in other nations in Southeast Asia, as well as the Middle East. A whole 60 seconds to wait for a COVID test result? The Israeli virus site diagnostic company SpectraLit COVID test can give you a result in a few seconds. 
after you gargle 10 millilitres of a saline mouthwash and spit in a tube. The test has been trialled with 400 people at Sheba Medical Centre and showed a 95% accuracy. The device shines light through the sample and onto a special chip to determine the sample's spectral signature and calculate its composition. Spectralit uses artificial intelligence to interpret the reading from a gargle sample to work out the difference between the mouthwash signature from a coronavirus positive person as opposed to those from non-infected people. Each test costs less than 25 cents and the device will eventually cost less than $200. This one second COVID test is being piloted in 12 hospitals around the world and in two European airports. It will be rolled out to dozens of other European airports after it gets regulatory approval, presumably from the pilots being effective. Travellers in European airports are currently asked to self-test in booths with non-contact thermometers. This gargle test will be added to those self-testing requirements. Listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Science at diffusionradio.com. Brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And now from 2011, let's talk about confirmation bias. Peter Bowditch has spent, or maybe wasted, a lot of time in discussion with people who seem impervious to anything which contradicts or challenges their beliefs. When errors or contradictions are pointed out, there is a brief pause for breath, and then the errors are repeated as if nothing had been said. This got him thinking about the resilience of belief. So here's Peter to talk to us about confirmation bias, denialism, and Morton's demon. I was going through my record and CD collection and two songs caught my attention. One was The Boxer by Simon and Garfunkel, which has the line, A man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. The second was Rod Stewart's Reason to Believe, which says, I look to find a reason to believe. These got me thinking about how we have a need to believe things and the lengths we will go to be comfortable with what we believe. I'm saying we here because I'm not immune to the problems I'm going to talk about. With a little caution, we can avoid the traps. Anyone who has ever done any research will be familiar with the problem of confirmation bias. This is hearing what you want to hear. My studies were in cognitive psychology, where it is impossible to get directly to the processes underlying observations, and so it's all about statistics and interpretation. Anybody doing research in the social sciences has to be constantly aware of the possibility of confirmation bias, of selecting results and readings that fit the hypothesis, and either ignoring or eliminating things that don't quite fit. I don't mean rejecting obvious outliers where the observations are so far from the rest that a mistake can be assumed, I mean shaving the results to suit what the experimenter expects to find. This may not even be a conscious act, because doing it consciously approaches fraud, and most people are basically honest. The classic case in the hard sciences of confirmation bias is cold fusion. Pons and Fleischmann found what they wanted to find, and then they stopped looking. In the social sciences, there were Cyril Burt's just-too-good-to-be-true statistics about separated twins, and Margaret Mead's willingness to believe whatever some young girls told her. In medicine, there was William McBride's work on Debendox. I don't think any of these people started out to do the wrong thing, but they all did it anyway, because what they did confirmed their beliefs. I'm not talking about obvious cases of deliberate fraud like Andrew Wakefield or the Korean investigators into fertility here. These people knew exactly what they were doing. Confirmation bias is rife in paranormal research, largely because this research is carried out by true believers. While there have been cases of deliberate fraud, the most common problem is testing until some anomalous situation arises and then stopping, claiming evidence of psychic or paranormal powers. I was adjudged the most psychic person in the room at a sceptics function once, and I did this by correctly calling a coin toss seven times in a row. To a paranormal researcher, this could be seen as evidence of my superpowers. But as I pointed out to the group, with about 120 people in the room, you'd expect to take six or seven tosses to eliminate everyone. Confirmation bias is one thing, but the next stage is denial. The results or data which contradict beliefs are rejected. Again, this can be a totally unconscious matter, but a true denial that has to be deliberate. The driving force behind most scientific denial seems to be political or ideological. The people I most commonly come across practicing denial are Holocaust deniers, who turn into anti-Semites within seconds if pushed, 
climate change deniers, I refuse to call them sceptics, whose politics are often quite visible, medicine deniers, including AIDS and vaccine deniers, who simply reject all science that doesn't agree with them, creationists, who reject anything that conflicts with their religious beliefs, and generalised conspiracy kooks like 9-11 truthers who reject anything that comes from a government. These groupings aren't mutually exclusive, and because conspiracy theories are close to the surface in almost all of them, it's not unusual to find people have fallen into more than one category. I would almost bet money that I could start a website and attract followers by arguing that the attack on the World Trade Center was done on the direct orders of the President of the USA in order to distract the sheeple's attention from plans by the Jewish-owned banks to print money to fund plans by Big Pharma and the Illuminati to expand their mind control through microchips and vaccine and to spread AIDS in Africa so that big oil could control African resources and get everyone to pay more for petrol and electricity by telling them that oil and coal were made millions of years ago instead of 6,000 years so that they're running out. Actually, I won't place that bet because I know a couple of websites that already say things like that. I've observed the resistance of facts in many of these groups at first hand. A few years ago, I unwisely entered into a debate with some professional creationists. Yes, they were paid to do it. I was able to show that some of the very people I was debating against had had the science explained to them more than 20 years before, but were still making the same claims. It doesn't seem to matter how much research is done to the safety or efficacy of vaccines, but it's all rejected if it doesn't prove that vaccines cause autism. If you don't believe the germ theory of disease, then no science is going to convince you that antibiotics work. One strange aspect of denial is that often people will be presented with evidence that conflicts with what they already believe. But if it still agrees with their general belief system, they will accept it and consequently hold two contradictory opinions at the same time. Any 9-11 truth are worth his place in the movement knows that no planes flew into the World Trade Center, but the planes were flown by Mossad agents who also worked for the CIA. I once challenged a group of alternative medicine believers by offering them five different cures for cancer, each based on a single unique cause of cancer, and all med there is cancer, and all forms of the same. I pointed out that at most one of them could be correct, as they were mutually exclusive, and I asked them to tell me which one was the correct one. I was universally informed that all of them were correct. A beautiful example of the way this thinking works comes from alternative medicine, where I've been told that germs and viruses do not cause disease, but AIDS is being deliberately spread in Africa using vaccines contaminated with HIV. This belief is held simultaneously with the one that says there is no such disease as AIDS, and if there were, it would not be caused by the non-existent HIV, but by the use of recreational drugs, or in extreme cases, by drugs used to treat AIDS. HIV has never been proven to exist, despite Luke Montagna winning the 2008 Nobel Prize for isolating the virus. Even if it did, Robert Gallo didn't prove that it caused AIDS. In a case of total bizarrity, Montagna has been adopted as some sort of hero by Alt-Med, and his Nobel Prize, for discovering something that they say doesn't exist, is used to boost his endorsement value. Well, I never said there was any logic for the way that people think. Did I say think? I'm oh, sorry. I mentioned that I studied cognitive psychology. I often hear this ability to hold two logically contradictory opinions as simultaneously true, described as cognitive dissonance. It isn't because dissonance implies awareness of the contradiction. Cognitive dissonance is the situation where someone acts in a manner contrary to their belief is resolved by rationalisation or justification. The ability to hold two contradictory positions simultaneously and believe them both to be true can't be described by a better word than the one George Orwell invented for 1984, Double Think, which he defined in the book as the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. It must be obvious that anyone who can happily practice doublethink is going to be somewhat resistant to conflicting information, because they can assimilate it without rejecting what they already know, provided that it disagrees with what they know to be false. I want to finish by offering a light-hearted explanation of this phenomenon of resistance to conflicting ideas. It's called Morton's Demon, and was first described by Glenn Morton in 2002 as a means of explaining why creationists will listen carefully to what you say and then completely ignore it. But first, some background. In 1871, James Clark Maxwell suggested a thought experiment which could show how the second law of thermodynamics could be violated. Given two rooms separated by a molecule-sized door, a demon at the door could allow fast molecules to go from room A to room B and allow slow molecules to pass from B to A. This would eventually cause a temperature difference between the rooms and this difference could be exploited to do useful work. The second idea was to have the demon only allow molecules to pass in one direction, eventually leading to a difference in pressure. As the demon used no energy, this would be a form of perpetual motion machine, and the second law would be proved to be flawed. Now while this argument might convince someone who didn't know how the universe works, it was soon challenged on the basis that the demon would in fact use energy to observe the molecules. 
This is an example of how science works. If something is proposed which defies what we know, then the first thing to look for is why it might be wrong. Glenn Morton expanded the idea of Maxwell's demon to explain the resilience of nonsensical or wrong beliefs. He was particularly concerned about young Earth creationists. He had actually been one himself. But his demon applies to a much wider class of people. His demon sits at the front of the mind and filters incoming ideas, only letting in those with which the person agrees and blocking the rest. This is much more powerful than any system where the ideas are tested for compliance by the mind and then rejected. They don't even get considered in the first place. I have seen people repeat the same 40 arguments within minutes of being informed with evidence that they are wrong, and I do mean minutes. As these people appear to otherwise be functioning human beings who can even tie their own shoelaces, it seems reasonable to infer that the counter-arguments are not being perceived, let alone being evaluated and rejected. Hmm. I think I see a thesis in cognitive psychology somewhere here. I'll give the last word to a young Earth creationist who was commenting on a discussion of Morton's demon by a group of Christians who were in general agreement with it, and using it to comment on the unreasonableness of some young Earthers. I think it illustrates the problem very well. Anyways, the whole demon thing. In my thinking, demons certainly do influence people's thought. However, I don't see why a demon would have any interest in leading someone to believe in a young earth rather than an old one. Satan and his legions have no other interest than to take God's people away from him. They hate God and they hate his people. But if a Christian believes in a young earth, in what way are they farther from Christ than a Christian who believes in an old one? We are brothers and sisters in Christ. If we have a small difference of belief but we still share the love of Christ, then in no way has the demon accomplished the only thing he wants to do, which is to drive us away from Christ. And all I can say about that is QED. Peter's website is at www.rapags.com, where you can see him beating his head against the brick wall, separating sense from nonsense and science from non-science. Next up, Cognitive Bias by Bradley Ray. I'm biased because I knew it all along Hindsight bias, I knew it all along I'm biased because I put you in a category which you may or may not belong Representativeness bias, don't stereotype this song I'm biased because of the small detail that grows off the big picture of a thing Anchoring bias, see the forest for the trees I'm biased toward the first example that comes to mind Availability bias, to the first thing that comes to mind Oh, bias, don't let bias in your mind Bias, don't try this at all I'm biased because I'll only listen to what I agree with Confirmation bias, you never mind if you are this I'm biased because I take credit for success, but no blame for failure Self-serving bias, my success and your failure I'm biased when I remember things the way I would have expected them to be Expectancy bias, false memories are shaped by these I'm biased because I think my opinion now was my opinion then Self-consistency bias, but you felt different way back when Oh, bias, don't let bias in your mind Bias, don't try this, it'll influence your thinking and memory Guilty of distorted thinking, cognitive bias, man becomes blinded. Decisions and problems you've been forced to solve them wrongly. That was the Cognitive Bias Song by Bradley Ray. And finally, here's a few of the 2019 Ig Nobel Prize Ceremonies 24 7 lectures. 24-7 lecturer will explain her 
or his topic twice. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. And then, after a brief pause, a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. The first 24-7 lecture will be delivered by a scientist who won the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, Rich Roberts. His topic, serendipity. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. Serendipity is exemplified when your clever experiment fails because nature is trying to tell you something important and it leads to a Nobel Prize winning discovery. It's also exemplified when you're booked on a plane flying from Boston to Los Angeles on September 11th and the meeting you're attending is moved one day earlier and at the last minute you have to fly on September 10th instead. This happened to me in 2001. That's it. Now a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. Serendipity means good luck has struck again. <laughs> the next 24-7 lecture will be delivered by a professor of cognitive science at Hampshire College, Joanna Morris. Her topic, theory of mind. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. Theory of mind is the ability to impute mental states, beliefs, intentions, desires, emotions to oneself and to others, and to understand that others have beliefs, desires, and intentions that are different from one's own. Theory of mind is probably viewed as a theory because mental states are not directly observable. Each human can only intuit the existence of his or her own mind through introspection and no one has direct access to the mind of another. The presumption that others have a mind enables one to understand that mental states, you know, go well. And now a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. Surprise, other people are just like you. <laughs> The next 24-7 lecture will be delivered by the president of the B.F. Skinner Foundation, Julie Skinner Vargas. Her topic, habit. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. A habit is an operant under discriminative control of SDs correlated with facilitating postcedents which are delivered when emitted in their presence. <laughs> and now a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. A habit is acting as usual again. <laughs> Karen Pryor is one of the founders of Clicker Training. Karen Pryor will tell us ever so briefly about Clicker Training. Here's Karen Pryor. Oh, goody. This device may not all have one in your pocket, but you will someday. It's a clear, sharp sound. And what it tells you when someone has made a move that you like and you click during the move, you have learned that they did exactly the right thing and they have learned that and they feel successful. And you're right, they are successful. It adds up quickly to a clear form of communication between different people, all positive information. And what we communicate this way will be true will work for you. And furthermore, it works for all animals down to guppies. Thanks to Mark Abrams from the Annals of Improbable Research, improbable.com, I'll play a specially edited version of the 2021 Ig Nobel Prize Ceremony for the Christmas special. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. 
Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please subscribe to the Diffusion Science Radio channel on youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin Cloud of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambaka Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in northeast Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed this show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.